So without further ado, a colleague, but most importantly, a friend, let me welcome Dr. Robert Maurer. It's a pleasure to be with you. Hi, Bob. Hi. How are you? Oh, fine, for, given all the circumstances. Yes, we're, we're all faced with all those circumstances, and we have a, a wonderful opportunity to discuss those and what those circumstances are creating in our lives and the, the angst and some of the trials and the fears that we have. And I want to let the audience know that Bob and I were just together a few weeks ago in yes. Manitowoc, Wisconsin, where we had the opportunity to engage with educators and people from the juvenile justice sector, the child welfare sector, community-based organizations, just a wonderful array of human beings and the institutions that they represent to kind of come together and learn more about the work that Bob is doing in the area of, of fear and, and understanding how we can be more passionate and successful in life. And of course, our special focus with, with Kids at Hope is understanding this dynamic we call hope not just as an emotion, but as a strategy. Yes. But Bob, kind of walk us a little bit through your work, how it started, uh, what you discovered, and, and then we'll kind of chat about that as to how it, it, it's applicable into today's times. Well, the uh, work we're going to be going through today started to, close to 30 years ago when I was walking through the medical school library and came across a book that uh, sadly today is very timely called Plagues and Peoples. And it's about the history of the plagues, smallpox, cholera, malaria, yellow fever. Uh, and the book talks about how the plagues shaped the course of human history. And I've always used that sentence as I've given these workshops, but I think as all of us can see this, what we're going through now is changing our lives, changing the way we view the world. And we don't know what changes are yet to come. But what was amazing about this book is there were very short paragraphs on how each of the plagues was cured. And I was startled because I thought, as perhaps many of us do, that the way we cure a disease is we find the people that have it, subject them to whatever technology that we have, and eventually find a cure. But every one of those plagues, again, smallpox, cholera, malaria, yellow fever, was cured by somebody looking at who wasn't getting sick and trying to figure out why. So to make a long story short, our research team at UCLA began collecting studies that followed people for decades. The shortest was 15 years, the longest 75 years. Some followed even from the time the mother came in pregnant with the subject till they were 40 or 50 years old. And what these, all these studies had in common is they were looking to see in spite of adversity and challenges and setbacks like the ones we're going through now, what, how, what, what allowed people not only to sustain their physical health, but their relationships at home, at work, and their actual quality of their work. So health, relationship, and career were being measured over the course of decades. And as I said, all these people had challenges. Some lived through world wars. They lived through 9-11, et cetera, et cetera. But what allowed some people to overcome those challenges? What was amazing is there's over two dozen studies that have done that, and they basically all get the same results. So one of the things, because many of these investigators allowed us to come and listen or view their, their information, and one of the things that startled us was how often these interviewers, interviewees would use the word fear. They would talk about being afraid or talk about being scared. They seldom use words like stressed, anxiety, depressed, tense. And it took us months to figure out why these people were using the word fear. And where we ended with realizing that, that small children, as most of your viewers can attest to, either as parents or certainly in their work, uh, find that children don't talk about being anxious about the boogeyman or tense about going to, go, having to go to school. They use words like afraid and sad and scared. And that what we found in successful adults is they assume that when life gave you challenges, fear showed up that life could be scary and fearful. They didn't see this as a personal sign of failure or something to be ashamed of. For them, it was a normal part of life, uncomfortable, unfortunate, but necessary. The reason we think children go see scary movies all summer long is they know they've got to engage fear, uh, whether it's with their families that they're scared of or challenges at school or bullies or anything or problem with friends, that fear is a part of their daily life. They might as well go to the movies and have some fun time trying to engage it. 
By the time we become adulterated, fear is no longer seen as a normal part of life, but something we get angry at for showing up. So we're living through another period of history. There have been many where a disease comes along and we realize how little control we actually have day to day. We're hoping that as we take care of our bodies and take care of our families and wash our hands and do all these things that we're um, learning to do, that we're reducing our fear, but having fear of the uncertainty of how long this is gonna last and what it's gonna, how it's gonna impact me and my family and the people I'm serving in my work, all those uncertainties, uncertainty is a grown up word for fear. So we found that successful people assumed fear was a normal part of life as, a, as opposed to something they had to get angry at for showing up. I think that's a, a wonderful insight and, and one we have to truly embrace in terms of understanding what we're feeling right now. The fact that, that fear is a part of the human condition. Uh, and I know in w watching your work and, and following your work, uh, that fear is also a motivator for us for achievement. Yes. And, and certainly, I think the idea of washing your hands, uh, social distancing, uh, the quarantining are ways that we're hoping we can control the conditions around us to protect ourselves rather than to be victimized by it. Right. So would you talk to us a little bit about how fear becomes a motivator and when it becomes uh, a, paraly a paralyzing uh, reaction where it's not no longer healthy? So the one side of fear is, is healthy and one side of fear is, is unhealthy. Right, because uh, fear was intended as an ally. There's a place in the brain, in the middle of the brain, called the amygdala, A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A. -A -A. And the amygdala is considered the brain of the brain. And every mammal has one of these. It's what we taught in school is the fight or flight response. And so the other advantage of thinking of it as fear is to say animals are stressed or anxious or tense is kind of a stretch. But we know every mammal on the planet deals with fear fears of hunger, fears of survival. And so the amygdala, which we share with every single mammal, is wired differently in mammals. So when, the, when a deer is frightened by this, a, sa a sound coming from one direction, it triggers the amygdala, the fear response, and the animal knows what to do next. It runs the other direction. And it runs 20, 30 yards, and assuming nothing's happened, fear shuts off. When a bird hears a twig snap, uh, it's same fear response as you and I, what does a, a bird do? It flies away. A mouse sees a shadow coming overhead. Again, the same amygdala as you and I, instead of sitting there going, oh my God, is that a hawk or branch above me, a 747? Mice don't worry, they run and burrow and hopefully make it in the burrow, in which case fear shuts off, or the hawk eats them, in which case fear shuts off. <laughs> the last animal is example is when a, when a, when a hunt, hunt, hunter's approaching a lion, the lion attacks its danger when it's afraid. So every mammal has a law, if you will, of what it's supposed to do when it's afraid. Again, the deer runs, the bird flies, the mouse burrows, the lion charges. So I've asked audiences all over the world if every other mammal on the planet has a law for what it must do when it's afraid, what's the law for our brain? And people kind of scratch their heads until I ask them, um, those of you with children, what did they do when they had their first nightmare, a thunderstorm? And of course, the answer is the same all over the world. As soon as the, uh, that child was mobile, it ran into your bed. You held them as if, and said, it's only a nightmare, as if that word meant anything to a small child. And what your daughter or son do next? Went right back to sleep in your arms. So ch chimpanzees and humans are rather unique on the planet. In response to fear, what our brain wants us to do is to reach to another for support. Now, this is a real, and again, there's a hundred studies on this, finding that whether it's reducing cardiac risk, whether it's enhancing your relationship with another human being, uh, whether it's succeeding at work, reaching to another person for help is what the brain wants us to do, which is a particular problem with this problem, with this crisis we're going through now, because we're told wisely that we need to isolate ourselves um, and so reaching for support can be very difficult. And some of the children that your viewers serve uh, are lacking the opportunity to reach for support physically, which is important to them, emotionally, visually, to the teachers, to the instructors that are, are watching this.
So it's a real challenge right now, but we know that giving support and receiving support is one of the ways the amygdala quiets down. Now we can talk about some others because emotions designed to put us in motion. And so fear is designed to motivate us to do something. And for many of us, we can actually see some silver linings in this because people are now washing their hands. They're being very careful what they put in their bodies because they want their immune systems to be strong. So there's some positive things coming out of this, but um, the cost we're paying for it is dear in terms of human welfare, human kindness, and, and the ability to calm that fear mechanism. I think, I think that's probably one of the most powerful parts of what your understanding and what you've shared and what I've learned from you and what your audiences have learned is that as a, as a human being, as part of the mammal species, uh, that when we're fearful, uh, the natural response is that we as human beings reach out to one another. Yes. The problem being, as we've seen in our work, is if the child is reaching out, but there's no one to reach back. Yes. then what are the other options? And that is true for adults as well. So yes. when you don't have that strong support group and you reach out and there's no one there to reach back to you, then you have to reach for a bottle of alcohol or you have to reach for drugs or you begin to isolate yourself, not under these conditions, but, but you withdraw, uh, you become depressed, you become yes. anxious. And all those things are the result of not having the proper support group, and particularly the, the young people and the most vulnerable, the young people that we, we focus on, where the schools and other institutions that were available to them when their own families weren't of that nurturing type, okay. that they could find that nurturing in school, and now they've lost that particular opportunity. So what suggestions or recommendations do you have uh, as this idea of fear uh, being a, a normal human emotion and a motivator, but also recognizing now that that, that, that fear becomes all-consuming and we have to moderate it in some way, shape, or form. So what suggestions or practices would you suggest under these current circumstances? Yes. Um and you pointed out some of the unhealthy ones that people adapt to because any substance, whether it's nicotine or food or alcohol, calms the amygdala, but only for a few seconds at a time, which is why people overeat or drink too much or start smoking more. Is the, as long as there's some substance on the tongue, the amygdala thinks the lion's gone away. Um, and those are not very healthy ways. The other that I wanted to, to mention um, that you alluded to is that um, – the amygdala builds in its own internal parent. So as children, we rush to our parents for support in a healthy family. And because our parents are nurturing and supportive and loving, the brain builds in its own internal parent. But if you grew up in harsh circumstances, um, then the brain builds in a harsh voice. And the way I demonstrate that in classes is I'll say, how many of you consider rejection painful? Everybody raises their hand. I say, well, let me prove to you that's not possible. I say rejection comes in many, many forms, but romantic rejection is one form. Is that correct? And everyone nods their head. I say, well, let me show you, see if this is one form. I go up to someone in the audience and say, so Sally, would you like to go out with me Saturday night? And suppose I say to the audience, Sally says, you know, Bob, I'd like to, but I'm busy flossing on Saturday night. Gets a laugh. As I walk away, is that rejection that hurts? People agree, yeah, that, that would hurt. I say, well, let me see if that's what happened. I went up to Sally, asked her out. She gave me this lame excuse. As I walked away, which of these two voices was more likely to happen in the center of my head? Door number one. Boy, Bob, am I proud of you. Nice try. That was gutsy. Could have been a little smoother. Next time you'll do better. I am so proud of you for trying. Door number one or door number two. Boy, did you sound like a jerk. Who wants to go out with you? You're old, you're ugly, you're fat. Nobody likes you anyway. Which is more likely, one or two? And the audience agrees, too. So does that voice show up at the best of times or worst of times? And people say the worst of times because that harsh voice got built in, in childhood, certainly for many of the children that we serve and for many of us who grew up in families where parents didn't have the tools that we have today. So and that harsh voice has been there all of our life. We think it's us. So if you're angry at yourself for being afraid or angry at yourself because you're not being as patient as you want with your own children or because the demands you now feel are so different, whatever it is, that harsh voice 
makes just makes the amygdala go through the roof and makes the fear unbearable. So the first thing I, I ask your viewers to consider is when they're upset, whether it's again with somebody in their own family or some problem they're having with the technology they're trying to master or whatever else is the challenge, is that voice in their head nurturing and supportive and saying in so many words, because that part of the brain has emotions but no language, but saying non-verbally, it's okay to be scared, it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to ask for help, or is that harsh voice telling them they should be better, different, something or other, in which case the fear gets louder. So the first suggestion is monitor that nurturing, that voice to see if it's nurturing. We can talk about how to build one in if you like. There's also some healthy ways to kind of fool the amygdala into quiet, quieting down. For example, breathing is the accelerator pedal of the body. It's physically impossible to be fr frightened and breathe slow physically impossible to be calm and breathe fast. So most of the time, we don't pay any attention to our breathing. We take it for granted. But if you're sitting there having these thoughts about all the things that could be going wrong or are going wrong, um, all the things you're missing from your life before this virus showed up, then it triggers the amygdala. If you can co concentrate on breathing slowly, ideally in through your nose, out through your mouth, um, you can actually calm the amygdala. It has no calories and no side effects. Um, it's, and the tech, there's another technique called controlled breathing. If you go on YouTube, you can see five or six different versions of it, which teaches you how to master your breath so that when you start to breathe faster, it's like the red light on your dashboard. You're driving along and that red light comes on saying engine, you know your day just took another turn. Nothing else is more important than keeping this expensive piece of equipment tuned up. You want to get to a place if in your breathing starts to escalate, you have that same awareness you would have with a red light on your dashboard. So those are a couple of them. I'll give you some more if you like. And I think what, what's, what's important about this time in our history is our ability to focus on what we know works well. I think in the typical day, whatever that used to be, uh, where we were busy being busy and didn't have a, t have a moment to slow down and, as we would say, catch our own breath. We Literally. didn't have a moment to, to slow down and catch our own yeah. breath. So we, be we didn't practice that which you just outlined for us because we were busy being busy. Now we understand we're in a different situation. And these suggestions, these recommendations, these practices, strategies that you offered become even more pronounced for us to, to, to practice those. Now I want to talk about the inner voice as well because within the practices of hope, we understand the power of that inner voice. Mm -hmm. uh, we understand that we can make conscious and un unfortunately unconscious choices. We can choose to be hopeful or we can choose to be hopeless. Right. One of the ways we can choose to be hopeless is let our emotions take control of us, right? Yes. Uh, and just and just kind of uh, surrender to the fear, uh, surrender to the anxiety, sur surrender to the sadness, and all those are normal human emotions. But exactly. when you're mindful of what you're going through, then you can begin to understand you have a choice. You don't have to continue to be sad. There are other things that you can do, and I think that's what you were just outlining. There are things you can do to kind of break out of that moment. And one of those that we offer is that inner voice. And we teach our young kids, and as well as our adults, but we teach our young kids to share the Kids Hope Pledge. I am a kid at hope. I am talented, smart, and capable of success. I have dreams for the future, and I will climb to reach those goals and dreams every day. Yes. All kids are capable of success, no exceptions. When they hear that, that becomes, although they're doing it consciously, the unconscious side of who they are begins to record that message. Yes. And when they find themselves in difficulties and they don't feel talented, smart, or capable of success, we want that voice to be triggered. Yes. But if that voice isn't practiced, then there's no way to trigger it. Yes. And the beauty of children, because their brain is still developing, is that look on our teachers' faces or any agency as, as the child walks through the door, the energy that that teacher brings to the moment, the brain's building in that alternative to the harsh voice that may have been there as part of their childhood. I remember one of the uh, 
great instructors in adverse childhood experiences says that that amygdala is designed so if you're in the woods and you see a bear, the amygdala will trigger fear so you'll take the response. But then she said something what quite haunting. What happens if the bear is coming home every night to your house? So if if in that school or whatever or in the environment that you met, uh, other of your viewers are working in, if they're able to get to their own enthusiasm, their own optimism, their own hope, the brain will take the healthier option. So it isn't even the words we say, but the emotions that we're trying to get mastery of, as you say. The other thing we found in the success research, and it sounds kind of um, uh, 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 grandiose, is when they were in a crisis, they tried to see what lessons they could learn, how they could use this as a classroom. So the fear that most of us or all of us are going through today, many of the children we serve, that's been their daily life from the time they were very small. And so if we can see that our, our challenge right now in the face of all this uncertainty and loss and disruption, if we can find the hope and the optimism and bring it forward, it not only will enrich the children that we're serving, uh, but our own families and ourselves. So to see this as whether it's a spiritual practice or just a, a, a way of looking at life, seeing this as a classroom for us to learn to stay hopeful for ourselves as well as the people we serve. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we'd love to have that large support group where everyone participates in the raising of a child. It takes a village to raise and educate yes. a child. So let's empower the village to do that. But sometimes it's only one person in the village that takes interest in that child. And that could be the changing agent, right? Yes. Uh, we would love the more the merrier in becoming part of it. And, of course, our work focuses on culture being the service delivery mechanism, not just program. So we're not, we don't want to have a program help kids navigate life's conditions. We want the culture to be embracing and supportive of the young person. So wherever the kid goes, but sometimes in today's world, there isn't a culture. That's what we're trying to build. So we're, yes. we're on a movement to, to, to create that. But in the meantime, it doesn't, it doesn't eliminate that one individual to make sure that that child knows someone has their back. Yes. That they're just not there to teach or to service or to counsel or to guide. They're there to support. They're there just to be a a, 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 a caring human being. Our, our point is, it's not that we don't have enough adults in kids' lives. There are plenty of adults who are delivering one service or another for these kids. So it's not the, not the issue of, of having, not having enough adults. The issue is whether these are caring adults that truly, as we would say, believe in the kid, connects with the kid, and then teaches them to think about their future. So I want to kind of talk about the future uh, with you a little bit more in terms of being successful in, in home and community and work, as, as you would talk about. That idea of being successful is seeing yourself being successful. I first have to visualize myself uh, being successful. And, and in our mind's eye, being successful means you're contributing to your family, to your community, to your workplace, to yourself. Yes. So you're become a contributing member of society by contributing, but being successful. And, and, and so the visualization of that becomes important. And we believe that visualization is part of the process of becoming hopeful. Yes. Can you talk to us about this idea of, of the science of success? Yes. Um, the visualization is a very key piece of that because one of the things we found consistently in the research is something we now have a name for called mind sculpture, where we learned this from athletes, but it showed up in all of our studies. And that is the, when they were anticipating a difficult encounter or in, in sports, just preparing, they would close their eyes for just five, 10 seconds at a time, imagine themselves in the situation, whether it's a child who's just giving you nothing back or actually being difficult. Um, close your eyes, imagine yourself in the situation, seeing the child in front of you and without moving a muscle, what you would say, voice, tone, gestures. Um, and you do this just five or 10 seconds at a time, but several times a day. Because what the brain decides to use to reprogram itself is repetition. 
So it's like advertising. If I draw two golden arches, even if you've never set foot in McDonald's, you can tell me a half a dozen of their products because they've shown you those commercials again and again and again. And so practicing something five, 10 seconds at a time, but several times a day gives the brain the message, this is where she wants me to go. So you can learn to reprogram the brain that way. So you're responding to difficult situations um, in a very, in, in the way you would ideally want to. And it's ideal to practice before the situation shows up. So anticipating somebody you're gonna see tomorrow or the next day, whatever. But what we found in all these studies, Rick, was that there were four skills every one of them used. The one we've been focusing on, understandably, is they were aware of and accepting of fear. They assumed it was a normal part of life, not a sign of failure. And there was a willingness to reach for support and to give support. The second skill is they either had a nurturing voice attached to the amygdala or they were aware that that voice in their head was harsh and they were working to reprogram it. And we can talk more about that if you like. The third skill is they were aware of something every child reminds us of in one form or another. And that is we have a powerful need for attention. That mommy, mommy, look at me that little children have. We don't outgrow. We just as a culture for some strange reason have decided that need disappears. And so many of your viewers are people giving energy all day long to the children, to their colleagues, and then coming home sometimes to families or partners they're giving energy to. But what successful people were aware of is that need for attention was as powerful as the need for food or water or sleep. And they would seek out people who would be generous and reciprocal and giving them attention. Because if you're gonna be giving energy all day long, you've gotta find a way to get it back. And then the fourth skill is something we've been alluding to, and that is they had a sense of vision or purpose. That, uh, that drove them so that even in these very difficult times, they saw this was one more opportunity to practice being loving, being hopeful, being optimistic, being caring to whoever I'm in front of. And then something that drew us to each other was that realizing, as you've said several times beautifully, you don't know what small moment, whether the smile you're giving a child or the nurturing you showed when they were acting uh, harshly, you don't know which small moment, which phone call, which letter you're sending to the house, uh, is going to change somebody's life. And so treating every moment you can as precious. I think that sense of intentionality of knowing that you can either make an emotional deposit to a child in yes. a split second or an emotional withdrawal, but understanding that that's happening. It's never neutral. It's either withdrawal or it's a deposit, but it's never neutral. Just ignoring a kid is a withdrawal, you know, a huge dismissing one, yeah. a kid is a withdrawal. Whether you say anything harsh or not, it's still a withdrawal. So yes. the intentionality of knowing that when I'm present with a kid, something is something either good or bad is going to happen, and I can control that uh, relationship, right? I can control that because the kid's still developing. But to your other point, I think is equally important that how can we be of service to others when we ourselves are struggling. So how do I focus on the needs of the young people I'm serving when my amygdala is overactive? And I know you've given us a couple uh, exercises and strategies to that, but talk a little bit more broader that, that how can I be of service to someone else when I'm struggling in, the, in, this, in, this, in this moment as well? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. And there's several answers. One is, is to see that struggle as something that brings you closer to the children that you're dealing with. Many of us have lives that have been so much more protected than the children we're serving. And so it gives us, for some of us, the first time in our lives, the sense of just what these children are feeling moment to moment, day in, day out, and that we're trying to help them see an alternative to. So one is it can give us some empathy as opposed to thinking, how can I be helping these other people when I'm such a mess, we're all a mess together in this and we're trying to recover and keep and sustain and enhance our humanity for ourselves and each other. Another technique um, is to journal. Uh, the, the research finds if you journal about anything you're upset about in the most profane language you want for 10 or 15 minutes a day and then burn or flush the pages, that it gives you a lot of physiological release and strengthens the heart. 
the obvious things, of course, in terms of diet and exercise and sleep. Um, but there's another technique that we found very, very helpful, and that's to reprogram that inner voice so that when you're afraid, the voice is more nurturing and supportive and calming the way we are often to the children we're serving, giving ourselves that same voice. Because the reason, the reason we're so good at our work is our children are getting the thinking brain, the cortex. We know no matter how upset we may be with that child in the moment, we want to be as caring and empathetic and kind as possible. But we don't give ourselves that same break. So the way you practice that nurturing voice is actually so simple that it's sometimes hard to convince people it, it, it can be done. So what you do is out loud, preferably, because every time you talk, the amygdala wakes up, you rehearse the voice you'd rather have. If you like, I'll demonstrate it. Please, so, I'll love you too. I'll, I'll give you the negative voice, but I encourage your readers, they don't need to practice that one. For most of us, that harsh voice has been built in long ago. <laughs> it doesn't need any rehearsal, but just for the contrast. So here's a voice from my early years at UCLA. I, that, not, not anymore, but here, this voice would show up. Here's the negative voice. I have this really tough job, Rick. I work in this small building in Santa Monica. We provide care for many poor people that would come in with so many social and psychological and economic problems we could do nothing about. And a group of young physicians making mistakes as they learn their craft and faculty senior physicians who thought everybody should do things their way. All right. What's the voice I wanted to replace that with? I have this amazing opportunity, Rick. I work in this small building in Santa Monica where we provide care for many poor people that otherwise would get no health care at all. And a group of young doctors training for one of the noblest branches of medicine, family practice, and a group of faculty who could literally double their income doing anything else in health care. If we could provide a quality experience for these patients, if we can train these young doctors not only to be competent but compassionate, if we can learn to get along with each other as a faculty, we'll be a beacon to the world. Now, the only chance that second voice has of showing up is practice. If I can rehearse it, again, five seconds at a time, but several times a day, eventually the brain decides that's where he wants me to go instead, and it builds in that nurturing voice. So, and, and, and we know practice, practice, practice in all aspects of our life yes. with the sense of intentionality, right? Whether we're on a, a diet or exercise program or mental health or mindfulness or controlling our amygdala, uh, we, we know that we can create those new neural networks that allow us to be, choose to be positive, uh, choose to have the positive inner inner voice, choose to be yes. hopeful, choose to be optimistic. We know the other conditions are going to happen. Right. And we'll just be a little bit more resilient when they do, and they won't become overwhelming to us. Yes. One more technique is for reasons nobody's ever been able to figure out, the brain cannot reject a question. Mm -hmm. Any question you ask repeatedly, the brain's compelled to pay attention to. So if just once or twice a day, you can do this by yourself, you can do it with uh, anyone you live with, um, what's, uh, just to ask yourself, what's one thing I'm grateful for at this moment? Because I think as all of us can realize how many things we took for granted before this virus showed up, just being able to sit in a restaurant, being able to walk down the street and not have to walk on the other side because this person may be carrying the virus. So many things in our day-to-day -day life that we enjoyed that we took for granted, and we're probably doing the same thing now that we're taking for granted, even what we have uh, in this limited time. So if you ask, what, what am I grateful for? two, three, four times a day, even if you don't have an answer, the brain's a creature of habit. Eventually it decides this is what she wants me to pay attention to and starts committing columns of cells to gratitude. So when you ask for the eighth, 10th, 20th time, your brain's like that kid in the front row going, I know, I know, and is popping out answers. So you can reprogram the brain to focus on what we still have to be grateful for even in this challenging time. Let, let me add, and then I'm going to open it up for questions because I'm sure the people are watching us, and, and I love this, these conversations with you, Bob. I, I love the moments we're together, and, and, and they're so rich and, and full of opportunity to be better than what we are today, which I think is part of we as human beings wanting to grow, wanting to explore and examine our potential. Uh, but I want to add this one little piece, and then open up for for Q&A, 
and that is that that hope is a choice, right? We, yes. we, we, we know that we're going to be bombarded with a lot of reasons not to be hopeful, but that we can choose to be hopeful. And one of the best ways to be choose to be hopeful that I think is very consistent with what you've been sharing with us is that hang around with hopeful people, hear their messages as well, because you will adopt uh, their behaviors. We're social creatures, so we want to fit in. And if the group that we choose to fit in with is a negative group, uh, naysayers, a sense of hopelessness, a sense of victimization, we will adopt many of their behaviors because we want to fit into that group. Yeah. That's the group you want to avoid. The group you're seeking is a group that has these positive discussions, uh, dealing with current problems, not ignoring the problems, but talking about the strategies that you just outlined in your small little office in Santa Monica, turning those messages around that they become positive, and that becomes what we call nutrition for the brain. Uh, <laughs> yes, literally. My, my wife encourages me to eat broccoli. I don't like broccoli, but my body does, right? And I may not like to practice these positive messages, but my brain needs it. Yes. So we, we get to make those choices. And uh, if we're, again, consciously aware of those choices, our brain will do what it does best. Yes. And it will help direct us because it wants, our brain wants to be positive. Our brain knows that that's, it's healthy. Our liver wants to be positive <laughs> or healthy. Our heart wants to be healthy. It just needs us to kind of give it what it needs, exercise and nutrition and, and, and strong thoughts in that regard. So thank, thank you for helping to guide this conversation to show how much control we have of our own destiny yes. and that what we're experiencing today is not that far-fetched from what other generations have experienced in one shape, form or another. Very true. Yeah, and what so, brought us together was that all the research we are accumulating was already being manifest in the work you're doing with Kids at Hope. So it was, it was wonderful to see it flourish in a real-time circumstance. So you're doing extraordinary work, as are the viewers. And I, and I hinted earlier the, the book that introduced me to you and, and then ultimately created this, this friendship was uh, One Small Step Can Change Your Life. And when I read it, I realized that I was trying to take too many big steps. I wanted that overwhelming change overnight. Sure. And, and when I broke it down into incremental steps, I found that the level of achievement taking place even faster. Exactly. Uh, than the innovative yeah. way that uh, I was supposed to be able to change almost overnight. But we'll, we'll, we'll save that for another discussion, but I'll, I'll toss it to Kim for uh, some Q&A from our viewers today. Great. Thanks, Rick. Kim, it's all yours. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. You can. Good morning and good afternoon to um, Bob and Rick and all our treasure hunters. Um, I like to get a shout out to the people that I've seen join us. We have about 365 people joining us um, this morning online, and I'm sure I'll miss some of the states that are representative, but we have um, Arizona, of course, Washington, up where you are, Bob, um, New York, California, Florida, Maryland, Wisconsin, Michigan, and I'm sure you'll all start throwing them at me in the chat here, the ones that I missed. But um, just wanted to say hello to everybody and thank you again so much for joining us for our Hope Forum. We do have quite a few questions. I, I see um, Chicago, Illinois. I see New York. Uh, I don't know if our friends are, oh, I see Canada. Uh, so, yes, DeRay, DeRay. Hi, DeRay. Okay. <laughs> Um, so we had a couple of different people ask this kind of the same question in a different way. So I'll throw this one out to you first, Bob. Um, please discuss how to create that positive inner voice. Um, the question may have come before I did the demonstration, but the first um, is to write down, if you can, what you would be saying to a loving, to, your, to a child, to your mate, to anybody you uh, adore and cherish, what you would say to them if they were going through or, or if they are going through the same circumstance you're in. So you want to write that out so that it's as concise as you want. Now, mine was several sentences. Yours can be three or four words. But the first thing is because is to engage the cortex, the thinking brain, 
by saying, all right, what would I say to a, a, a child or somebody I love if they were going through the same thing? And then practice saying it out loud in the tone of voice you'd say to that a child or that a friend. And again, you do this just for five, 10 seconds at a time, but three, four, five, six, seven, eight times a day. Uh, you can do it silently out loud tends to be faster because you're trying to build it into that old part of the brain. And so with enough rehearsal and enough can be anywhere from a week to three weeks, the brain decides that's where you want it to go and starts to build in that nurturing voice. Um, and so it's, that's the simplest way to, to, to do this. And then the other way is you use mind sculpture. Imagine yourself in a situation, whether it's with somebody that you're frustrated with or some situation or some place where you felt like you lost your temper or got frustrated and you wished you hadn't. And close your eyes, picture yourself in that situation uh, just for five seconds. Again, if you had done it beautifully in the way you would have ideally wanted to, what would it have, uh, what words would you have said, what tones, what gestures, just five seconds at a time, but several times a day. And like the golden arches, the brain decides this is important and commits cells to it. So it's, it's that simple. But again, because that harsh voice has been there all of our life, the first step, and it sounds like you're already there, is to recognize that that voice is present and it's not serving you um, and making it more difficult for you. So thank, thank you, Bob. Kim? Sure. Um, a couple different people asked this question also in different ways. Um, how do we keep our fear of future pandemics or whatever the future holds from totally changing our social way of life? Um, that's a great question because one of the things fear does is enough is it's it's present in the moment and we start anticipating the future um and it, when 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 we were walking the savannah that fear of the future was life-saving when you were walking rick and i were walking the savannah having a conversation and trying to anticipate what direction the lions were heading yesterday trying to be trying to anticipate where the water might might be uh so fear about what was going to happen next was is a biological part of the brain but it obviously isn't serving us because we don't know what the future will hold <laughs> um so there's a couple ways to do this um one is is to again as as rick said so beautifully in so many different ways it's an opportunity to practice hope and optimism um by trying to imagine what the best future would look like and actually savoring that there's actually studies um anecdotal studies of course of people who were in concentration camps who survived um and who went on to lead fulfilling lives and one of the things they would often say is while they were sitting in the camp in situ in, in situations more dire than I can even imagine. They were trying to imagine what the what the most wonderful meal they would have when they left the camps. Um, so practicing hope, practicing optimism, literally is one way to do it. Another is something called the stop technique. Um, because again, the brain's a creature of habit. You think of something wonderful you want to do when this um, uh, pandemic ends. Uh, for example, sitting in your favorite restaurant with your favorite person. And every time your mind starts to go into the future, you say silently, stop, in kind of a strong tone of voice. And for five seconds, think about sitting in that restaurant, visualizing yourself in front of this wonderful person with a wonderful meal. Go back to what you're doing. The fear of the future will come right back. You keep doing it eventually your mind gets the hint and is spending its day thinking of wonderful meals you'll have in wonderful restaurants when this ends, as opposed to thinking about all the things that can go wrong. And Rick was also talking about surrounding yourself with positive people, which means it was also uh, reflects also in the media. You want to be sure that the only time you're watching television is when they're giving you useful information and limiting that because a lot of it is fear-based and designed just to keep us glued to the TV set without really giving us um, a lot of useful information or the optimism that we need. I think, so I, I think it's like going to the chip drawer constantly right it's just easy to kind of have that immediate satisfaction right and, but we know it's unhealthy and i think that's true in terms of overwhelming ourselves with a lot of bad news constantly that's the chip drawer we have to avoid uh and just take it incrementally with just useful information bob yeah. I, I love the concept of mind sculpturing because i know in presentations i've sat in that you've made in our discussions 
we talk about the architecture and the geography of the brain. Yes. And and in mind sculpturing, you actually get to change the architecture and geography of the brain. Yes. So I just and love that that term. Yes. Yeah. And there's a book called Mind Sculpture that takes you through all the science of it, but doesn't give you any tools. Um, but the tools are available either on my website or on the book, or um, you're welcome to contact me through Kids at Hope, and I'll be happy to give you some individual uh, ideas. But again, the fear of the future by itself was an evolutionarily, biologically a useful thing. It's allowed us to survive. Uh, it's just not doing us much good at the moment. And there's many reasons to be optimistic, including, of course, there are so many people working on vaccinations and so many heroic stories to pay attention to of people helping other people. Yeah, right. Kim? Okay, ready uh, for another question. I, and I have one for you. Okay, uh, cool. So, Ali wants to know, is it, it's, uh, Lee says, it's true that you can't pour from an empty cup. So what advice do you have for teachers during our current situation? teachers or actually anybody who are pouring it into their families, students, and also extending their learning as they tackle online learning, that, which is specific to teachers right now. Yes, an enormous amount of energy going out, learning the technology, uh, wanting to be there for children and your own family, uh, absolutely. Um, and that was that third skill I mentioned of the need for attention that um, the, the, na the basis of your question is, how do I get some of that energy back for myself? And I wish I had a, a kind of simplistic answer for you. Ideally, uh, there are someone or somebody in your life who can be, you know, give you praise and attention often because most of the people watching this uh, went into the healing professions and went into the teaching profession because you love to give. Uh, and giving fulfills your soul and your spirit and your identity. Um, but sometimes uh, people who give are reluctant to ask for help themselves, reluctant to ask people for um, uh, praise, for attention, and in the way that children, healthy children do, and the way your dogs do, when they come up to you and they just will insist on being petted. Um, we're no different than that dog or cat waiting to, to be petted. Um, so the real challenge is if there are people in your life who are nurturing and supportive and caring, um, can, can you find the courage to ask them to give you the praise, give you acknowledgement, um, give you that? Because uh, sometimes we've essentially trained people in our lives not to do this for us. And sometimes we do it not even consciously. Someone says, gee, your hair looks nice. Oh, my God, I haven't washed it in days. That's a really pretty sweater. Oh, my goodness, I've had this for years. Out of our discomfort in receiving, we kind of have trained people not to give us praise. So... Um, uh, it it come, sometimes takes courage and can be a lesson for us in trying to get that cup half full again so that we have more to give. Um, when, when Bob, why, Bob why, do, why do we grab, and you know, again, from previous discussions, but why do we gravitate to people more easily when we find ways to complain to each other? Uh, so yes. given the opportunity to engage in a positive discussion, even with a stranger, or uh, have the opportunity to engage in a feeling uh, victimized by conditions that we tend to find it more normal to complain than it is to provide praise and encouragement. Yes, because um, there's, again, this powerful human need for attention. And again, those of you who work with children know this, um, or have raised children, that, that mommy, mommy, look at me is absolutely natural. Uh, but again, we live in a culture and people are going to scratch their heads a hundred years from now, wonder how we decided the need for attention disappeared somewhere between childhood and adulthood because we go to such pains to give it to children and sometimes to our mates or other people in our lives. But that need for attention we have just as strongly, but we have no rituals in our culture, most Western cultures, to meet this need for attention. Some cultures have done it physically. They're much more affectionate. Obviously, that's not always appropriate in the environments we work in. But um, the close, if you think about it, how do adults tend to get attention from each other? It's usually through conversation. Right now, I presume, hopefully, I'm getting all the attention from the people uh, watching. Uh, so it, it, adults tend to get attention through conversation. So then what kind of conversation? So imagine going up to somebody uh, uh, that you work with or live with and say, so let me tell you some things I like about myself. They're going to think something's wrong with you. So the way we tend to get attention culturally is through complaining. 
Um, I've, I've demonstrated this with classes. If I sit down next to a stranger on the airplane and start bragging about myself, they're going to want to change their seats. But you could start a conversation on an airplane complaining about the food or the small seats or the fact the flight's delayed and your soulmates before the plane leaves the ground. So we tend not to have healthy rituals for receiving attention. And if for the most part, um, people live with it. And because they have colleagues they see in the, in the, um, the teacher's lounge and because they have friends they see on acquaintance in restaurants or uh, at social gatherings, that some of that need gets met. But now in isolation, that focus of just giving to others as the, as the, as the caller um, was implying and not being able to get back what they were used to getting is a, is a challenge. So the simple answer, but it's simple but not easy, is to ask for it from the people in your life who are generous and are willing to give it to you. Uh, even You might even train your children to do this. Uh, one of the ways we've, we've seen this in families is you t it take turns putting each person on the hot seat, so to speak, and everybody gives them one specific compliment. And the person receiving it can't say a word, just take it in. Because again, we, we tend to want to give it back or say something to discount it, to, to try to recover that childlike innocence of just taking in a compliment. If I say to a child, boy, that's, you're really pretty, or that was wonderful what you did, the child doesn't feel any need to reciprocate or compliment me. We're trying to get back to that. So filling that cup is, is a beautiful question. And I hope that answer helps some. You know, when we talk about uh, that, that hope is a choice, uh, one of the suggestions we make is think about uh, a, a very exciting bit of news that you receive, something that you're very joyful around, good news. Uh -huh. and, and who would you call to share that good news with yes. that would mirror back your level of joy and enthusiasm? And some people have a very difficult time yes. uh, being able to identify those because they haven't nurtured those types of relationships. And when we have something for that need for attention, when something good has happened for us, we want to share it with someone, but yes. we want that person to reflect back the sense of joy and enthusiasm. And yes. often people have a very difficult time when we ask them, who would, who would be the first, second, or third person you would call that you know that they would embrace the joy that you're feeling and reflect it back to you? Yes. If you can identify those people, that's who you want to hang out with. Yes. Yep. Kim? Ab absolutely. Okay. Um, a couple people have asked if you could please give the four skills again. Sure. Be happy to. Um, the first skill is an awareness and acceptance of fear and a willing, you see fear is a normal part of life, um, and, the, and a willingness when afraid to reach for support. It's not that you have to, but you see it as a strength, not a weakness. Um, the second skill is either a built-in nurturing voice that non-verbally is saying it's okay to be scared, okay to make mistakes, okay to ask for help, or that you're aware that you need to build that voice in so that harsh voice doesn't own you anymore. So, uh, um, and then the third is awareness of the need for attention, um, a willingness to give it, and more critically, particularly since, again, all, every one of you watching this is by definition a giver, and you went into challenging professions because giving is so important to who you are, um, but a willingness to give it and receive it. Um, and that can be a real challenge because, again, for many of us, our strengths are our weaknesses. And the fourth skill is uh, a vision uh, or purpose, uh, meaning that you are seeking uh, to be of service to other people and to create hope and, and optimism in the pursuit of service to others. Because serving others can be very, very challenging and difficult. So while you're, uh, it's easy to get martyred or, or victimized or dis uh, disappointed. So do you see service as a place where you're learning to be hopeful that each step you take is something that can lift your life and the lives of the people you're giving to? So we tend to use the ac ac acronym STAR, the S stands for support, the, the, T, the T stands for Tabernacle Choir, because when I went through that example of um, uh, rejection, um, when, when someone, when you're not getting the results you want is the voice in your head um, saying, 
you did great. This was a good try. Next time you'll do better. All the time you're hearing the Hallelujah Chorus from the Tabernacle Choir. Um, so the T stands for Tabernacle Choir. The A stands for Attention. And the R stands for Reach for Support. Oh, no, the, I'm sorry. The first stands for State versus Goal, which is... Um, um, and while you're pursuing the goal of helping a child or helping your children or learning the technology, are you attempting to stay enthusiastic and energetic and positive? Are you focused on what emotional state you want to achieve while you're pursuing your goal? So state versus goal. And the R stands for reach for support. So I hope that wasn't too confusing. I think we have time for one or two more questions, but I want to remind everybody before I forget that this whole form is being recorded and you will receive a link to this. So if you missed any of the information that you see of value, uh, again, we have uh, uh, we'll archive this, we, we, we recorded it and it will be available forever. So I think it's just a good refresher to have back and forth. And the other side of it is that uh, should you wish to have uh, Bob and hopefully me, Bob and I come to your communities, to your schools to do our joint presentations. Uh, both of us live for those moments. Yes. Uh, we, 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 we love to help and help others navigate uh, those thoughts and research that we've uncovered that create a sense of wellness for all. And, uh, and I think the blend between what Bob shares and us translating it into a culture where everyone benefits, not just some people benefit, but everyone benefits is something that we have to continue to promote. So we're a little bit self-promoting in this regard. It's for all the right reasons that, that th this information needs to be shared uh, and not just re uh, restricted to certain audiences, but really for an entire community to benefit. Kim, a couple more questions. Okay, um, we have, we've had for our past few webinars, and again today, some students in juvenile detention watching. Um, so Marvy want us, is passing along a question from one of them, which says, would you say that people replay the same method for control that was learned in early childhood, or does this develop as a teenager? Um, as a general rule, they, they, they copy the same kind of controlling devices that they learned as a child. So as a general rule, yes. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to overcome is to give them a healthier alternative. And again, looking for what moments we can uh, take advantage of um, to give that, their brain a different experience than the one they grew up with, absolutely. And I think what we know through those developmental years too, Bob, is that you know, childhood, that learning period, and then adolescence, that testing period, right? Yes. So we, we, we kind of learn and then we test. And as we become more uh, towards adulthood, we begin to stretch those limits and see what we can get away with. <laughs> and so there's a lot of risk taking in adolescence yes. uh, and good choices and bad choices. And I think that becomes kind of the bottom line to both of our message is know when you're making a good choice, know when you're making a bad choice, know when you're eating too many chips and not enough broccoli, right? Know that yes. because that, then you control your own, your own destiny. Yes. Okay. The other thing one that last happened, question? Okay, please. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's just oh, ready for, ready say... for one, one last question that we have okay. to wrap up. Okay. okay. Um, and along the lines of um, knowing what's good for you and sticking with your healthy diets, Sabrina wants to know also what advice do you have in terms of longevity with our optimism and hope? It's easy to get started, but when the going gets tough, it's hard to stick with it. Yes. Yep. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question in terms of longevity. Uh, you're absolutely sustain, right. The, the sustainability. How do you sustain it? Ah, How do you okay. Sustain it? Yes. The way you sustain the easiest answer to that uh, is that if you're practicing this for five or ten seconds at a time, um, then uh, it d doesn't require willpower, self-control, discipline. Um, the challenge is to remember to do this when your amygdala is overwhelmed and uh, your cortex is shut down. So sometimes it's helpful to put up some reminder. I have that, that acronym STAR uh, on my dashboard and where I shave in the morning to remind me of these skills and how to use them. Um, 
But if you're doing the five or 10 seconds at a time, something that reminds you of hope or optimism or um, practicing the nurturing voice, eventually it, the tide starts to change. So these, these, these techniques we're talking about take hope themselves because they don't work quickly. Um, but the good news is they don't take a lot of time or energy. The challenge is to remember to do them, whether it's the breathing or the mind sculpture or developing your own tabernacle choir voice whatever it is. Well, th thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you for joining us and taking time from what is, a, I know, a very busy schedule for you. And again, sharing your insights, sharing your research, tr sharing how that is, is translated into very simple but very powerful practices that, if adopted, can truly change our lives yes. and know that it needs to be done incrementally. You don't expect the change overnight. Uh, those of you that want to be in touch with Bob Maurer, uh, you can do that through contacting Kim at kidsathope.org or Kim Heredia, Kim.heredia, is that right, Kim, at asu.edu. Uh, you'll find us one way or another. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday, 2 o'clock Eastern time, when we welcome Charlie Appelstein, and you know his work with uh, some of the most behaviorally challenged young people. Um, Bob will provide the, the level of enthusiasm that has been a moniker for our, our, our hope forums. So from the bottom of our collective hearts to each of you for the work that you do, yes. for being in the trenches on behalf of kids, for caring as much as you do, thank you for joining us, and we wish you Godspeed. Yes. Thank you.